We meet in an hour of change and challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. If this capsule history of our progress teaches us anything, it is that man in his quest for knowledge and progress is determined and cannot be deterred. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Welcome to the next episode of the Energy Impact Podcast. We are joined today with Keith Bowen, wholesaler manager at ESCOM with an economics background. He is a wheeling expert. Keith, it's so good to have you today. Right. Thanks very much, Adam. Good to be with you. Yeah. So let's hop in. Tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, have you always been in the energy environment, in the energy vertical? When did economics and energy come together for you? Yeah, well, I started off at, in Eskim as a programmer. So when I started in 93, so it's quite a while ago in the IT area. Uh, and then I got interested in the economics. My background was the computer science and economics kind of degree. Um, but, and as I developed more on the economic side, I went to the post-grad economics uh, training. So yeah, so now I'm pretty much, I still, I still do a bit of programming, but it's more about the, the economics and uh, planning for the sort of power sector. All right. So ESCOM is located in South Africa. We've got an international listening base. So for those of you who don't have too much familiarity with the country, here's a few quick stats. It is 471,359 square miles, which means it's a big country. It's halfway between the size of Texas and Alaska if you need a framework. There's 11 official languages in it. It borders Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Eswatini, and Lesotho. Uh, Keith, Tell us a little bit about ESCOM because not everybody's familiar. Okay, so ESCOM is the pretty much the monopoly service provider for electricity. It's been going since the 1920s and sort of over time, particularly uh, before 94, was amalgamated into this large entity that was responsible for the bulk generation, bulk transmission um, and distribution of electricity. We have municipalities, large scale uh, local government, who do most of the reticulation into the lower level uh, of uh, customers, but still the bulk transmission is done by, uh, by Eskim. And we, at the moment, are just over 90% or thereabouts of the generation output in South Africa. So 90% of the generation, who is accounting for the other 10%? Is there IPPs or independent power producers? What's, what's the framework look like? Yeah, so historically, we've also had quite a few of the industrial uh, customers would be able to self-supply. So we've got Sassel, Sapi, a large industry that could do their own generation. So that was the bulk of it historically. But it, since 2013, we've been running a program for particularly renewable IPPs. Uh, mm -hmm. And we've seen that grow to now we're just uh, on, on the system, it's about 5,000 megawatts, just over 5,000 megawatt of renewable IPPs that have now connected to the South African grid. And is the, is the system still bundled if ESCOM was originally doing generation, transmission, and distribution? Does it still play a role in all three segments or are things shifting a bit? It still at the moment plays a role in all three, but there was a roadmap that the government put out about a year and a half ago, which now sort of starts the framework of creating subsidiaries, separate subsidiaries for generation division, transmission division, and distribution division. And, and that kind of ideally kind of moves in that framework towards sort of competition and, and generation and having an independent or more independent transmission company, which handles the buying and the transport uh, for the for generation. So if ESCOM's generating 90% of the, the country's electricity right now, what are we talking about in terms of, of numbers? So the, in terms of our, Peak demand, peak demand in the, uh, was sort of about 10 years ago was about 36,000, just short of 36,000 megawatt. Mm -hmm. At the moment, the capacity, the rated capacity for generation, ESCOM generation is 45, 46,000 megawatts. 
Um, but a lot of that isn't always available. And we have some performance issues in our generation fleet. So we struggle to make, meet high peaks, but it's still um, our rate of capacity is 45,000. Mm -hmm. um, we've now, added, as I said, we've added 5,000 megawatt of renewable IPP and another thousand still to come as mm -hmm. in the process of being connected. Government's about to roll out a program for another 2,000 megawatts of renewable IPP. So it's, the renewable space is growing quite significantly. But uh, um, up till now, so that's really sort of the size that we kind of have the capacity to produce for 50,000 megawatts, but our peak is about 36. Um, yeah. so, so that brings us to the, the main topic of today, wheeling. So you have an IPP that decides to start operations. They, they win a tender, they get approvals, they go through all the regulatory processes that they need, and they're able to start delivering electricity to the grid. What happens? Okay, so the big thing, uh, the most tricky uh, thing that has really sort of been in our experience in the last four or five years is getting the license. Mm -hmm. So um, up till recently, the regulator did not give a license unless there was a ministerial determination, which kind of takes us back to kind of an intricacy of our Electricity, Electricity Regulation Act, which says that the minister may determine certain capacity would either be built by ESKIM or go for private uh, generation to be purchased. Um, and generally, the regulator then says, for anyone who wants to come with a license to do their own, it's kind of, well, where do you fit into this regime? And so only now, more recently, have we seen sort of the minister saying, well, we're opening up to allow for people get a, to get a license for smaller generation. So it really has been a problem of just getting a license to be able to generate. But also, historically, there was the issue that trying to compete with Eskom's historic tariff for generation was exceedingly difficult. Um, I know about 10 years ago when the wheeling process started, we had some of the, uh, the larger coal uh, miners wanting to actually build their own power stations and wheel to themselves. Mm -hmm. But when we went and looked at the economics of it, they couldn't really compete with Eskom's uh, generation costs. And so, of course, there was always this kind of circular thing about trying to get some sort of rebate on the wheeling charge that they could make them viable. Um, and it really was historically a problem that Eskom's historic cost of generation was quite low. And that's obviously started kind of eroding the argument quite a lot lately. And now we're seeing that new generation capacity competes with new Eskom plant. Um, so, why, why was ESCOM's ability to produce and generate electricity so low? Was it because of the type of facilities that you have? Yes, yeah, so it was mainly, historically, it was also because we had large-scale large coal-fired generation. Mm -hmm. And the coal was historically pretty cheap. But also, the big thing is that most of those coal plants were written off in terms of you know, the kind of depreciation a long time ago. So the historic value... Uh, on those the costs associated with those plots is almost negligible because it's been depreciated. So even though it still has economic value, the, the, the counting says that it's cheap. So we don't actually have to recover huge amounts of costs for that stuff. So, but that's where the problem is building new. You now obviously have much higher cost of new capital uh, relative to the stuff that's actually kind of 40 years old and still um, is pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the problems with coal fired competitors. But now we're seeing that with you know photovoltaic, a new photovoltaic full life cycle cost is actually starting to get quite competitive with Eskim's average cost. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you know, we've seen the swing that it, just competing with cost was a problem. Now you can, but there's a licensing issue. Um, okay. So that's where the wheeling is starting to take off and why. So it's just to kind of give a, a background as to why wheeling has not been a big thing up till now mainly because of cost and then secondly, licensing. But we're starting to see those pressures building that we are seeing more and more customers willing to wheel, mm -hmm. going and investing in plant um, and then wanting to wheel across our network to other supplier, to consumers. And that's really kind of been the, uh, quite a shift in focus. For, for listeners that may be unfamiliar with what a wheeling framework is, how would you describe wheeling? It's really the, uh, the ability for a willing buyer and a willing seller to be able to trade. And then the transmission company or the distribution company just being the transport mechanism to get it from A to B. Mm -hmm. So that you've got the, it, you're kind of bringing the two together with the transport being paid for under whatever mechanism for wheeling, and then you can trade. 
and you have that freedom to trade with one another. Mm -hmm. So for us, uh, a big thing of what we have did about also 2008, 2009 was introduce a framework and we call it the wheeling framework, right? but it's, it's effectively saying that it's use of system. So any generator, wherever they connect to the network, they pay for the use of the network and they can sell to anybody else on that network. And so it's not about where do we think the electrons will flow from a contract perspective, but where are the electrons flowing physically? Mm -hmm. So we've got a whole model that goes and looks like so if the generator connects and when they plug in, where do the electrons flow physically and try and then charge them for that uh, as, as a use of system. And similarly for a consumer, they also, wherever they connect to the network and they uh, kind of receive the power, we do a model based on kind of where that flow is coming from to, to them, mm -hmm. but it's not about who they contract with. So it gives them the freedom that once we've got the use of system in place and they're paying for those charges, they then have freedom to be able to buy and sell to or from anyone on the network. So it's almost like, you know, there's a whole, the historic idea of the power pool, that once you're kind of in the pool, you can buy and sell with anybody in the pool because the, the transport mechanism is dealt with. Sort of. well, what are the conditions that are required to start wheeling and enter into the pool? Does ESCOM say, there are six things that you need to accomplish or have in place before that's that's allowed. Yeah, so there, yeah, there are quite a few. So one of them is having the license. Mm -hmm. So going to the regulator and uh, applying for a license and getting the license. Second, we have what we call a connection and use of system agreement, you know, the COOSA. And the connection and use of system agreement establishes all the requirements we have as a transport company as for transmission or for distribution to deal with protecting the network mm -hmm. um, and what kind of equipment and stuff. But most of it is just about you adhere to a grid code. Uh, so that's one thing I didn't talk about. We have a grid code. Mm -hmm. So we have the transmission code and a distribution code, which deal with how generators use the, uh, the transmission or distribution network and what are required from a generator's perspective, from a technical basis. So they would have to sign that. And then thirdly, we need to know who the off taker is. So they have to nominate who the off takers, so the consumer on the other side, so that we can do the reconciliation on our side. Because that, that's the thing is that we're not only the transport company, we also are the retail company. Um, so we need to make sure that when a customer, wherever they're taking their energy from, we reconcile their account so they're not paying for the same energy twice. Um, so let's say you've got a, a wind farm in the Northern Cape, uh, part of South Africa supplying to a customer in KwaZulu-Natal on the other side of the country, we would always get the metering information from that generator and then make sure we subtract that from our bill so they're not paying for the same energy twice. But what that would mean is also on the recon side is that the customer still pays for all the use of system component because we're measuring their consumption. We're just subtracting off the energy bill so that they're not paying for the energy twice. Um, As a result, is there an increase in the cost of electricity to in total that they, they're paying for, or is it that the individuals and entities that are generating electricity are generating at a lower cost, which then when the, the use of system fees are added on, it's about, even. how does that work? So again, because the network, the use of systems is all about the network cost, mm -hmm. and that is independent of where you're getting your energy from, mm -hmm. the only offset is on energy. So the network costs are as before. Even. Nothing's changed on the network costs. It's just now you, you, you again are just making sure that the right party is paying for the right component. Um, and it's something that maybe is not that obvious to people outside South Africa is that we have in, enshrined in the grid code that generators and loads pay for use of system. Mm. So like as a distribution company, you'd, you'd go and say, what generators do I have connected? I'm charging them for their connection. Mm -hmm. and that means I will charge less to the loads. Mm -hmm. For transmission, it's actually written that you have to do 50-50. 50% of transmission costs are covered from generators and 50% from loads. Uh, and so it means that when you've now allocated your cost for the generators, there's a, a geographical location signal mm -hmm. built into it. So if you're in a high dense generation kind of component and we have to transport a lot of energy to the load, you would pay more. But mm -hmm. if you're in a low generation kind of area and you're closer to the loads, you pay less. Um, so, so that's you, built. 
Yeah. So fees are, are varied in base based on population density, on the, the composition of the grid. And is there any geographic distance component too, or, or no? Yes. Yeah. So it's all about how you use the network. So that's the whole idea of the modeling using the distributed uh, shift factor method, going and looking at what part of the network asset you would be using when you, in, as a generator, you're putting energy onto the grid. So if you're close to the load, you would pay less. If you're in a place that's far from the load um, and you kind of have, we have to transport it over a longer distance, you would pay more. So there's definitely a, a very strong geographic signal in the transmission pricing. It's less so on the distribution side and the distribution network is kind of, it uses some of the transmission inputs into determining it, but there are you know, different uh, factors that are at play in the distribution network. But the idea is at least from transmission, you're covering the costs of transport mm -hmm. from both generators and loads, which is kind of unusual. It doesn't always work like that in other parts of the world, but it does mean that generators, when they pay use of system, often they would have to incorporate into their energy costs, whoever they're selling to, some recovery for that use of system. Mm -hmm. So are there any other requirements that we haven't spoken about for, for generators to get a wheeling system up and running? No, it's pretty much those. I'm trying to think of others, but it's basically the connection agreement, the license, and then an off taker. Um, we have a fair amount of freedom because you know historically we haven't had a lot of participants in the wheeling. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the moment, I think we have about 15 wheeling transactions. Mm -hmm. we, we've never, it's kind of been pretty static. You know, from one month to the next, we know who the generators are, we know who the customers are. But we've, we're starting to find, as people are asking questions now about a future framework, mm -hmm. what about how, how quickly can I change from one customer to the next? Um, and from our perspective, it's also that as long as uh, on the customer side, they also have to sign a use of system agreement and a reconciliation agreement. That long as they've signed and we know who they are, you can always switch across customers. So we're trying to design it to be a little bit more flexible um, so that when a generator is running, come to the end of the, and again, we do it all in calendar month, come to the end of the calendar month, they can tell us, okay, of my output, 40% must go to that customer, 20% to that one, and 30% to that one. So we kind of can allocate it correctly. So hypothetically speaking, let's say that we start the, the Keith IPP 50 megawatts and I'm a high energy off taker and you'd like to wheel energy from your power generation facility to me. We have all the approvals, so we're, we're able to go and connect to the grid. How long does that process take to set up with you once we've entered into that PPA? It, um, it probably can take a couple of months because I, I know from just the, the legal issues of doing the contracting can take a couple of months, but once all that's signed, it's actually almost immediate because we, the big thing is what we would put in as part of the course is that we have remote interrogation for the meters. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the, the meters that would be in place would obviously be the IPP's meter and the ESCAM meter because ESCAM always needs to make sure it's coming onto the grid. So we would interrogate those meters. Historically, most of the time we've used for wheeling agreements, the ESCAM meter as the basis. So the ESCAM meter says this is what came onto the grid. Mm -hmm. We've As long as we can pick that up, we can then send the information through to the reconciliation so that the customer gets that subtracted from their bill on that side. So it's, it's pretty um, easy. Once all the agreements are in place, the mechanism flows relatively smoothly. So. Do, do any companies have agreements in place where they're wheeling to multiple entities, whether it be a municipality or an off taker at the same point yeah. in time, or are there 15 independent wheeling entities right now? At the moment we, do, we have, so there's one company that is it's almost like a trader They've gone out and they've purchased, they've done power purchase agreements with a number of generators, and then they've got one big customer. So that we then uh, take all the generation from those four or five generators, sum it up, and then that total amount is what gets deducted in terms of the reconciliation from that customer. We have another uh, generator that is actually split. So some of their consumption goes to one customer and some to the other, but it's a pretty static 75, 25, and it just kind of flows that way. Okay. We recently got a customer who has kind of moved things around a little bit. And they one of the big things that we don't have <clears throat> is that if, let's say, a generator produces 10 gigawatt hours, 
-hmm. but their customer only takes eight. Mm -hmm. What happens to the extra two? You know, and, and so that's kind of some of those rules that we've starting to look at. We have the facility to allow for what we call banking, where the extra two goes into sort of like an account, which we just manage on our side. And as the customer then takes more later, they can deduct from that banking. Um, alternatively, the generator can then nominate another customer. As long as that customer's on the list, that they've got an agreement, they can say, well, okay, so they're only taking eight, so I'm shifting. So 80% is going to them and 20 to them. But the problem is a lot of the time, we don't know that until at the end of the month when you kind of see what the customer did take. So there's a little bit of kind of flexibility in the process to try and manage it at the moment. It sounds like it's a complicated reconciliation process. Yeah, it uh, is a little bit like, yeah. Can you wheel to yourself? So back to our example of, of we have the Keith IPP. If you have not only the IPP, but you also have a, a mine, can you send the, the power to yourself? Yes. So we've got a couple of some of the instances we have are where it's a company that has a huge generator connected to their one mill. Mm -hmm. um, and that produces more than what the mill requires. And so it puts onto the network and it takes off at another mill at another part of the country. And it's just, it's, again, it's a reconciliation from our side. So we measure the output and we deduct it from their consumption on the other side. So yeah, it's completely doable. Historically, the licensing arrangement, mm -hmm. uh, and, and when we talked about what the nurse, what nurse, our regulator allowed, mm -hmm. it was really for own use. And it was a kind of a very limited definition of own use. It had to be within the company. Mm -hmm. So a lot of those were kind of easier, but now that has been freed up. So it allows for, from one customer to the next. Yeah. Are there any size restrictions? So if you had a 18 kilowatt solar voltaic system on the top of your, your residential roof, then you go, you know what? I'm really only using three kilowatt hours. So very, very minuscule. Can you sell back to the grid? Do you need a wheeling agreement for that? Yeah, not at this stage. The wheeling is only allowed for a plant that's at, I'm trying to remember if it's a medium or high voltage, but at least high, um, high voltage, you have to be. So it's not below uh, a kilovolt or anything like that. So you can't be a household putting onto the network. It needs to be relatively large. Yeah. Okay. What are and the again, questions? that's just because of the reconciliation issues. It's kind of like much. the administration to try and manage that. It's like, yeah. So is this somebody on your team that's literally doing, doing calculations on spreadsheets or is this all automated right now? At least the metering is all automated. So we pick in the, the, the metering comes through, but there's a certain amount of dumping the data onto a spreadsheet, sending it to the generator to confirm that they're comfortable with those values. Because we want to make sure that, you know, our meters have picked this up. Is that what your meter says? So that we're not uh, mis, you know, misaligning the values. So there's a little bit of admin there still at this stage. Uh, and then sending it through to the recon department to offset. We're kind of working maybe in the next six months of trying to get it into a little bit more of a streamlined system because we're expecting it, this to grow at quite a rate, uh, in which case we need to manage that. Well, let's talk about that growth rate. So you said that there's 15 entities that are wheeling now. When was wheeling again uh, turned on, so to speak? And then where do you see the rise? Yeah, so it started 2008, 2009. So we, we kind of did the policy work in 2008. And I think our first wheeling agreement was really 2009. Um, and now it's taken a while to kind of get going. And we've had a few that have been there for a long time. And it's just now sort of accelerated. And then what's happened is that we've got more and more applications because there's also a potential change in the law, which everyone's anticipating to allow for generators below 10 megawatt to be registered as opposed to licensed. Um, it's, it's, it's a proposed change that came from the Department of Mineral Resource and Energy. They're the policy kind of department and government. And they've said up till now, you had to have a license if you're above a megawatt. Mm -hmm. uh, and the licensing regime being a little bit more onerous than just being registered. Mm -hmm. And now they're kind of lifted the, proposing lifting their threshold to 10. So it means that you're going to find a lot of pretty large kind of PV systems and stuff on the, who would be willing to sell to customers across the network. And we need to accommodate that. So we are expecting it. It's just a matter of that like preparing ourselves for that kind of process as well. Okay, interesting. So we're, we're at 15 now. How many applications are currently pending? Are you able to say? No, I unfortunately don't know the, what's kind of pending because most of our thing is we're waiting for the licenses to be approved. And I don't know how many licenses are being applied for. So, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. 
Now, when when you started coming up with the policies for the country's wheeling regulatory framework, what countries did you look to? What type of research was conducted? What would you have done differently? Yeah, so our big thing was when we looked at this in 2008, it was really kind of the, the awareness was developing that we couldn't afford to build the next capacity. Um, we, we've kind of committed ourselves pretty heavily to two large coal-fired power stations. And it was kind of then looking beyond that and saying, well, we just don't have the financial capability to build more. Let's allow for customers to do their own. For some of it, we kind of, we did, just to give some history, we've done a lot of work even before then in 2003 about the possibility of actually having a competitive electricity uh, model in South Africa. And there we did it. We had consultants from uh, Norway, uh, sort of from sort of the Nord Pool kind of environment, from the US, from New Zealand, all sort of giving input into kind of developing a framework that was then put in place for the multi-market model. It was never rolled out by government, but at least a lot of that foundation was there when we then started coming up with the wheeling policy. Um, and, and there'd been quite a bit of work because the grid code was now in place and the, at least from a, a transmission point of view, and I think the distribution code had just been implemented, kind of gave us the basis to look at use of system being different from wheeling. So we're not charging wheeling charges, you're paying a use of system, which gives you freedom to contract with anybody else. Uh, and that was quite a big thing for us, was to kind of step away from this idea that you have to pay a wheeling charge, which is based on your contract path. This was now, you have access to the network you pay a use of system and you have freedom. So that was quite a big shift for us. And it kind of freed up a lot of the consideration as to how you did wheeling. What are some of the questions that you frequently get about wheeling that we haven't chatted about today? Well, one, it's definitely a thing that we are starting to think about how do, how do we deal with is this backup capability that if, you know, when we, as I said, we've got 15 generators in total, I think at maximum it will come to less than 50 megawatts at any particular point in time of wheeling. But if you're now starting to get larger generators and more of them, at some point it's going to get to 400, 500 megawatts, maybe more. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes an issue for the system operator. One, do I know what's going to happen in terms of this wheeling? You know, so it's, it's about declaring uh, what you're about to put onto the grid or take off from the grid. Um, and then also being able to monitor that that actually happened. Um, and so we start talking about balancing one being a thing, having a balancing mechanism, a balancing market mm -hmm. to make sure we're always balancing what's supposed to come on and what does come on uh, and accounting for that. And then the second is around the backup. So that if that generation didn't happen, is there something else to back it up if it's not there? Um, so we start looking at sort of a capacity charge or a capacity market. Mm -hmm. to um, if it's not for at least reserve capacity and ancillary services but also then just potentially any kind of generating capacity that is uh, available for call up by the system operator if that doesn't happen mm -hmm. so it is i think a step forward now for a, for the for the wheeling environment mm -hmm. if it gets bigger we do need to seriously look at those two aspects more than anything else how do you think that could potentially play out when it comes to some of the renewables like solar or wind? They're, they're obviously intermittent sources that you have a bit of difficulty controlling the, the output in a certain degree. I mean, if the wind turns on, there the windmills may spin. Um, how, how do you see that playing out? Will ESCOM be able to say to some of the companies, listen, you need to hold back, you can't produce? Or is, is a baseload a better option for you in, in the operator to plan? I think the idea is that we have to be realize, realistic that in South Africa, the future is about renewables. It's mm -hmm. absolutely, um, and uh, the concept of baseload doesn't really, it's kind of like becoming very 19th century, you know, yeah. kind of moving past that now. So it really is about being able to predict the renewable output. Mm -hmm. um, and we've seen, because I mean, even as part of the IPP program that we have in place at the moment, the wind farms, the solar um, farms have to tell us what it is that they're going to produce for every mm -hmm. hour the following day. And it's the, the um, forecasting capability is there and it's actually working pretty well. So as long as those wind farms and those PV farms are taking on the responsibility of that, they will make sure that their forecasting gets better because they're the ones who have to deal with the consequences. The, the second thing is that balancing shouldn't be seen as some uh, grotesque penalty that you're basically making it impossible for a wind farm to be able to generate. It's just ready to account. So if there's a backup, like they say, batteries would be a backup. 
that then there is the back the batteries are there you've paid a capacity charge that they're always there and then you can use the batteries and the cost is not something to bankrupt you know at the moment our backup unfortunately is diesel generators mm-hmm. and the cost would bankrupt anyone in a second if we were to have you continue that as our backup mm-hmm. but in the future you would expect that we now as long as we have the right incentives in place you would build the batteries or even if it is gas or whatever as our backup that that is it's kind of the incentive isn't there for generators to be more accurate mm-hmm. but it's not like a massive penalty that would uh, bankrupt them in seconds you just want to try and keep it within balance okay all right well Keith what else should we talk about um I know that we have a, a variety of things but we want to focus <laughs> on wheeling what's the one question that you wish uh, that we wish we discussed I think the, the, the one that we get quite a lot is because people are seeing it now. And also one thing we didn't talk about is the potential for municipalities to be able to buy for themselves. Mm. It's also, there was something that was announced uh, last year and it's kind of still going through the process is that the, some, particularly the large, we've got these metros, so the city of Johannesburg, city of Cape Town, Kuruleni, Etiquini, that they would be able to go out and procure for themselves. Now, the question that they're asking, and, and it's something that we get quite often is that, how quickly can they get the data? How do, how do they know what the generator is doing? Because obviously from their side, they need to check the bill. So this is becoming the real thing about flows of data, the real-time flow of data. So most of the stuff we deal with is metering kind of after the fact, which kind of, as long as that's there within 24 hours, I think everyone's comfortable because they can at least see what the status is. But it is going to be a thing in the future that you've got to have proper metering and uh, real-time flow of data so that customers can also manage themselves. So if, if I'm the city of Cape Town, and as we've said, we, we're talking about balancing on a generator, there should also be a balancing responsibility for the, for the customer as well, that mm-hmm. they start becoming what the term in Europe is balanced responsible parties, that they now look at it and they say, well, I'm going to consume 10,000 megawatts. So they need to be able to see, oh, I'm not consuming 10,000, I'm mean, either more or less. How do I get myself back into balance? And all of that is around having good data to be able to manage from their side. So I think that is the thing that we're, people are asking the question uh, and that's what we're trying to then focus as well is provision of data. It, it sounds like that's a great opportunity for, for IoT, Internet of Things of smart metering. Is there an initiative to simplify that? So you can almost require if you are in the process of signing up for a new wheeling mechanism, between two parties, you have to have a smart meter to automate that. Is that a process or is that just something that's a bit uh, theoretical at the time? No, no, it's it's starting to happen. And again, you can define what a smart meter is. You know, sort of we kind of have a, let's call it a relatively smart meter. It's not going to make intelligent decisions, but at least it's something that's remotely interrogatable. It's bi-directional. It can give you information that, you know, you can dial it up in real time, but it's not necessarily going to be making decisions on behalf of the customer or the generator but at least that it's smarter that it gives us access to data Um, so there are minimum requirements in terms of the code but it hasn't yet got to the point where we can really say we're talking about a proper smart grid as such yeah does south africa have a merit order of least cost of generation so if you're an off taker and solar is for whatever reason a few cents cheaper than gas fired plants or coal fired plants that you would default to that if it's available or is it this is what it is and and there's no variability i think in terms of our merit order if you think like rationally not take into account like power purchase agreements and rates that you pay that from a marginal cost perspective Mm -hmm. your renewables are your cheapest because there is no movement in terms of so they don't bid in a price it's kind of like really they've contracted for a price in terms of the PPA, but in terms of our actual scheduling on a daily basis, you will always take wind, PV, uh, any kind of renewable first. Then we have our nuclear power station, which is also like marginal cost, pretty much zero. And then we start with the coal plant. And from, we've got some cheap, still very cheap coal power stations to quite expensive coal power stations. Then we start looking at, we don't have gas, you know, um, natural gas, not a huge amount of natural gas in South Africa. So beyond that, then we've got pump storage facilities, which are already our large battery kind of, we charge at night and discharge during the evening. Uh, We've got some hydro, which is also relatively limited, but again, the hydro would also be in that renewable category where it's very low 
marginal cost for the hydro, but obviously if you want to try and optimize it, so it's only in your peak periods or like where, because there's so little of it available. Uh, and then we move into, we start with interruptible load. So we have some interruptible load contracts with some of our customers. So that's, and then demand response uh, kind of in, a, in the mix between those two. And then it's the diesel generators, which is kind of, our, it really jumps to the highest merit order that we have. So at this stage from a, operating the network point of view, um, the, the renewables are the cheapest. They're always kind of must run. They're always in the, in the mix. We do sometimes curtail uh, renewables because what happens, uh, uh, particularly in winter, we have such a high peak. Our, South Africa is very much a winter peaking system. So it's all about uh, space heating and stuff. So we find that in winter, the demand will hit our peak, but with uh, the peak will be seven, eight o'clock at night. And then not five, six hours later, you're hitting the trough in the middle of the night. And our coal-fired generators can't, can't cope with it. So they go and they sit at minimum generation points through the night. So we will often find through winter, we've got too much on the bars where you've got all these coal-fired generators you can't get off and then the wind starts blowing. And so what we will do is we kind of, we go through this merit order again, it's a lot depends on the extent of the problem, but we've got some hydro that we can back off. Mm -hmm. Then we would back off the wind if we can't take a coal-fired power station off the system. How does um, that technically work? So you reach out to a wind farm and say, listen, the, we don't have room. Yep. There's too much coming on. What do they do? So we send them a signal to say that we're now issuing a sort of a curtailment signal mm -hmm. and they would then respond to that. 90 plus percent of them do respond because again, it's, you know, the alternative is for us to just completely sort of kick them off the grid. But so they will respond by tapping their mm -hmm. sort of output and bring, uh, reduce the amount. It's very rarely is it reduce everything. It's kind of, we will take, mm -hmm. you know, reduce by 50% or 40%, whatever, and so that we can then manage the, the flow. There is in the power purchase, because most of those, or all of those at this stage are committed to a power purchase agreement with us as the buyer. So part of ESKIM mm -hmm. is the buyer's office. They get paid as if they generated. So they fully- Okay, so it's ticker pay. Yeah, pretty much. So they get fully compensated for their curtailment um, uh, when it happens. Mm -hmm. There are often some interesting intricacies because then after the fact, they will go and do their meter and they say, well, this is what we actually did. This is what we could have done based on the, uh, what we call the facility power curve. And that difference is what we have to pay. And we might have interesting backwards and forwards about the power curve and how much of the wind was blowing at the time, but usually that gets resolved pretty quickly and then we just pay them. Yeah. What are some of the other challenges that, that you run into related to the wheeling system? I think our big thing is knowing is, is that communication with the, the generators. Uh, so we, it's kind of one of the things why we want to try and improve that communication so that when we pick up the metering and we send it to them, if there's a query, they say, no, no, that's not what my meter says. There's something wrong with your metering. And we need to resolve that pretty quickly. Um, and it becomes a bit of an administrative burden on us. I mean, we're not really geared up for that in a, in a big way. It's still something we kind of have to work on. So that is an issue, just making sure that the metering ties up. Then it's verifying who the off taker is. Um, so as I said, not, over 90%, it's kind of static. We don't have a problem, but we anticipate that could be an issue. If you have said, you know, we've got the meter and we've got an off taker, but then the generator turns around and says, no, 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 actually quickly, I, I need to send 30% to that customer. Uh, those are things that we kind of need to work on. Yeah. All right, so overall, positive, negative outlook for wheeling in South Africa? I think a very positive outlook. Um, it's kind of the, the nature. One of the things we didn't talk about, even though we said we are talking about balancing and doing a, sort of a capacity, is that we're sort of also looking at the idea of kind of open up the market a little bit more, where you can have a day ahead market, uh, intraday exchange, and then your balancing to try and then move away from this thing of having to do physical nominations all the time. That theoretically a generator can sell into the pool, into the market, and then they have a contract for difference out of it, which has got nothing to do with the actual flow of energy. Um, mm -hmm. And try and kind of following sort of the, the Norwegian model uh, where you kind of have a market and the market clears, but then you have contracts for differences happening outside the market. 
Um, and that would be a big step forward to kind of stop having this really kind of hectic uh, kind of administrative burden, but to actually make it easier for willing buyers and willing sellers to be able to interact with one another. So, so if we took that one step further, are you able to, to generate within the ESCOM network and wheel to an entity, a, a off taker in another country, one of the neighboring nations? And uh, no, at this stage, it is an issue for getting across the border. The, we require that there's also a licensing regime for export mm -hmm. um, so that the export component has to still kind of be separately licensed. Then there are issues we don't have proper rules in place to deal with the cross-border, the interconnectors. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's still something that has been discussed. And there is a Southern African power pool and the Southern African power pool has rules for its members. But at the moment, the members are pretty much all the big utilities mm -hmm. and they have rules and ways of managing the flows of energy between the utilities. The moment you have a third party trying to come across through that interconnector, the rules are not in place to manage that properly. So that's something that we do definitely have to design kind of how to manage the capacity of the interconnector, particularly mm -hmm. allocation rules, and then the balancing at the interconnector is a thing. So those are still some of the issues that kind of need to be resolved. The one point uh, when you kind of talked about it, it kind of also triggers that at the moment, we also have an issue with wheeling from a generator with inside a municipality. All of our wheeling is in law, municipalities have to allow for wheeling and there's a third party access framework that they have to apply to or adhere to. But at the moment, all wheeling is between Eskim connected customers and Eskim connected generators. Um, so there's, there are some customers you're inside a municipality and the municipality has approved that the can flow can come off their bill and we can reconcile with them. At the moment, we don't have any case where there's a generator inside a municipality. One of our problems, and again, like an airing dirty laundry, is that some of the municipalities are not, we have issues with municipalities who don't pay when they take energy off the grid from Eskom. If you've now got a generator inside the municipality and it's trying to sell out, we would have to recon the energy that that has produced inside the municipality, sell it back to the municipality, and then deduct it off our bill on the other side because effectively that energy has been consumed by the municipality before it even comes onto our network. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a whole recon kind of chapter that we've never really gone into because it's too messy. Interesting. So if that were to happen, do you think that the IPP that was interested in that scenario would even know that that would be a challenge before they started operations? Or is that something that yes. they walk into and and you go, no, no, oh, they know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they know because it's actually happened to a couple of the existing uh, wheeling generators. Mm -hmm. We would not sign, we would not let them wheel because they were inside a municipality. That mm -hmm. was also kind of a problem municipality. So then it, it was that they actually had to build a network. So they, they invested in the money to build the network to connect to our network. Mm -hmm. And then we would, they could wheel. But if they were inside the municipality, it became a real problem for reconciliation. Oh, that's fascinating. So in, in a strange twist of events, it's almost as if there are certain locations in the country that are, are better candidates for, for wheeling than others. They are, very definitely. Um, but it is, it's a framework that we have to deal with because if we're going to expect more and more of this, mm -hmm. is that you have to have a way of dealing with municipalities so that you can recon with those metros um, and make sure that you still get your money at the end of it. So I, ideally, you would want to find a close proximity to a high population dense area or a high offtake area uh, that is not within a municipality, then enter into the agreement with ESCOM and the PPA with the offtaker to set everything up in motion after you have the license from nursing. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So there's still a lot of uh, <laughs> things for the, the poor generators. Yeah, totally. Well, it sounds like the, the outlook for wheeling in South Africa is very positive. It sounds like you have a long list of things that you can be working on, which is fantastic. Um, Keith, economics, economists, power managing at ESCOM, we cannot appreciate you more for taking the time today. Thank you for this master class. I don't think we can end it on a better note. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Adam. Great. Thanks. Our leadership in science and industry our hopes for peace and security, 
our obligations to ourselves as well as others all require us to make this effort to solve these mysteries, to solve them for the good of all men and for the progress of all people.